So why was the year 1962 so important? Well, in history, we saw John Glenn, the first American to orbit the Earth, take flight. We saw the release of the Beatles' first hit, Love Me Do. And we also lost an American celebrity icon from Hollywood. But in the world of baseball cards, 1962 signified the year of the first multiple rookie cards with the inclusion of the rookie parade subset in the 1962 Topps baseball card set. Prior to this, true rookie cards only featured a single player and sometimes it was confusing for collectors to signify what was a player's true rookie card. Throughout the years, Topps would continue to produce rookie cards featuring multiple players on the same card. Some of these rookie cards featured some of the greatest players in the history of baseball, including many, many Hall of Famers. But this series is not about those players. This series is about the players featured on the card with these iconic players. In the early 1960s, all through the 70s, and into the early 1980s, one thing that was a certainty was Willie Stargell was in the lineup for the Pittsburgh Pirates. Nicknamed Pops, one of the greatest ever to play for the Pirates organization, led the franchise to two World Series titles, won an MVP award in both the World Series and the regular season, won a few home run titles, and is now forever memorialized outside of the left field entrance at the Pirates' home stadium and enshrined in the Baseball Hall of Fame. But I am interested in sharing with you the careers of the three men who share that iconic 1963 Topps card number 553 with Hall of Famer Willie Stargell. So please join me as I introduce to you Brock Davis, John Hernstein, and Jim Gosker's baseball careers. Bryshear Barnett Davis, who goes by the name Brock, was a young 19-year-old left-handed rookie outfielder for the Houston Colt 45s in 1963. The product of the same high school in California that later produced major leaguers Bobby Tolan, Bob Watson, Davis would play one season at California State University Los Angeles, which also would be the school for future Hall of Famer Eddie Murray. Davis made his major league debut on April 9, 1963. He would spend most of the season playing for the AA San Antonio Bullets, an affiliate of the 45s. Yes, the Major League Club was named after a weapon, and the minor league affiliate was nicknamed the Bullets. Try passing that team nickname over in today's baseball. Davis appeared in only 34 games as a 19-year-old rookie, but made history on September 27, 1963, when the Houston Colt 45s fielded an entire nine-player lineup with all rookies. This was an attempt to draw more crowds to the nearly new franchise and put the Colt 45s in the record book. Along with Davis, the lineup featured such players in their first season such as Hall of Famer Joe Morgan, Rusty Staub, Jimmy the Toy Cannon Wynn, Sonny Jackson, and Jerry Grody, who all would go on to have long major league careers. Ironically, at 19, Davis would also collect his one and only Major League home run. After the 1963 season, Davis was sent back to Double A, where he would spend the entire 1964 season, with the exception of appearing in one Major League game. In 1965, the Double A affiliate relocated to Amarillo, where Davis spent the entire season patrolling the outfield without a Major League call-up. 1966 saw a promotion for Davis to AAA, and he appeared in a total of 10 games for the now-renamed Houston Astros that year. In 1967, Davis again found himself in AA for the Astros and was acquired by the Chicago Cubs after the season concluded. From 1968 to 1970, Davis spent time in the Cubs minor league system. In 1970, and perhaps the best year as a professional, Davis posted a 332 batting average garnering a call-up to the Chicago Cubs. This is interesting because Davis would again garner a 1971 Topps card as a rookie star, nearly seven years after his actual rookie season. As far as my research shows, 
This is the longest gap between rookie star cards for a player. In 1971, Davis would appear in the most games of his career as a major leaguer, appearing in 106 games for the Cubs, patrolling the outfield at the friendly confines. During the 1971 season, the Cubs decided to part ways with starter Ken Holson in return for the Oakland A's outfielder Rick Monday. This left Davis on the trading block to the Brewers, where he was traded for another outfielder, Jose Cardinal. At 28, he appeared in 85 games in 1972 for the Brewers and posted a career-high batting average of 318. Despite the strong year in the majors, Davis found himself again in AAA for the Brewers. In June of that year, he was then dealt to his native California, the San Diego Padres, where he never appeared in a game at the majors for the Padres and finished the year in AAA. Shortly before the 1974 season, he was then dealt back to the Cubs. But because the Cubs outfield was pretty much set with Billy Williams, Rick Money, and Jose Cardinal, Davis found himself again in AAA. In the 1974 offseason, the Cubs would again trade Davis, where he would spend a year playing for the Cleveland Indians organization in the minor leagues and never got a major league call up again. At the age of 31, after the 1975 season, Davis called it a career and retired from baseball. Post playing career, Davis went back to home to California where he would work in public service for Orange County until his retirement in the early 2000s. Davis is now enjoying retirement in California and helps coach baseball at a local high school. Hernstein, a top high school athlete hailing from Chillicothe, Ohio, became a third generation football player at the University of Michigan. Before that, John went on to graduate from Chillicothe High School in 1955, where he was an all-star athlete in football, basketball, baseball, and track. Hernstein followed in his father and grandfather's footsteps, attending college in Ann Arbor, playing football and baseball. He led the Michigan Wolverines as the team's captain on the football field in 1958. The six foot three, two hundred and fifteen pound fullback and linebacker was dubbed the previous year in nineteen fifty seven by the Sporting News as Michigan's big gun on the football field. Early in the nineteen fifty eight football season, a knee injury sidelined Hernstein, essentially ending his college football career during that season. Despite the football injuries he sustained during his football career, he was still able to compete on the baseball diamond for Michigan. Before attending college, he had been offered pro contracts but turned them down to pursue his Michigan Wolverine dreams. In December 1958, Hernstein announced he would sign a professional baseball contract but with the terms he could return to finish his degree during the offseason. The Phillies offered Hernstein a signing bonus of $35,000 and he found himself in the Phillies spring training in March of 1959. The Phillies assigned the 21-year-old Hernstein to their Class B affiliate in Des Moines. He would spend 1959, 1960, 1961, and most of 1962 playing in the Phillies minor league systems. In 1962, he batted 293, cracked 23 home runs for AAA Buffalo, earning him a brief call-up of six games with the Philadelphia Phillies. He would spend time between the 1962 and 63 season playing winter ball in Puerto Rico, leading the league with 14 home runs that season. Going into the 1963 season, the Phillies had a veteran outfield in place and he would again open the season in AAA, cracking 22 home runs and getting a major league call up for just 15 games with the Phillies that year. With two back-to-back -back strong seasons in AAA, the Phillies had no choice but to make room on the roster in 1964 for Hernstein. In 1964, Hernstein spent most of his time patrolling first base and appeared in 125 games for the Phillies. After the Phillies' now historic late season collapse in 1964, the organization began to retool their lineup and Hernstein found himself only appearing in 63 games in the 1965 season for the Phillies. Despite this, Hernstein would appear again on a rookie card sharing it with the great Richie Allen on a 1964 Topps card. Coming into the 1966 season, John led the team in spring training and home runs, shifting back to left field and was deemed the Phillies starting left fielder. After a slow start in April, however, Hernstein was dealt along with future Hall of Fame pitcher Ferguson Jenkins to the Chicago Cubs for veteran pitchers Bob Buell and Larry Jackson. This trade would later go down as one of the worst trades in Phillies history. 
Hernstein's time in Chicago was limited, only appearing in only nine games with the Cubs before again being traded to the Atlanta Braves for veteran Marty Keough in May. Hernstein appeared in 17 games for the Braves before being optioned to Triple-A Richmond for the remainder of the season. After the conclusion of the 1966 season, Hernstein found himself again traded to his fourth organization that season when the Boston Red Sox traded for him in December. Despite that trade, John would never appear in a game for the Red Sox and retired from baseball at the age of 26. John returned home to his hometown in Chillicothe, Ohio to begin a family and begin a career in finance for an investment firm, a job that he held until his retirement in the 2000s. His son Seth would go on to play college football carrying on the family tradition at Ohio State University in the early 1980s. He was very involved in the city of Chillicothe, serving on many boards and commissions to help the betterment of the community. Unfortunately, in 2017, John passed away in his beloved hometown of Chillicothe, Ohio. A Michigan native, Gosker grew up and attended high school in Port Huron, Michigan. A multi-sport athlete, he excelled in basketball, football, track, and of course baseball. No major college offers for any sports came Gosker's way during high school, so he enrolled at the local community college to continue his education and play baseball. After spending a year and a half in college, the Red Sox offered him a contract and he was assigned to their Class B affiliate in the Carolina League in Winston-Salem in 1962. While in Winston-Salem, early in the season, Gosker had a game where he drove in 10 runs in a single game. He would finish the year in Winston-Salem batting 283 with 19 home runs at the age of 19. In fear of losing Gosker to another team, the Red Sox had to protect Gosker on the 40-man roster going into the 1963 season. Only three re years removed from high school, Gosker found himself in 1963 playing for the historic Boston Red Sox at Fenway Park. Although he appeared in only 19 games as a rookie, he spent the entire season with the Major League Club. After the 1963 season, Gosker was optioned to the Red Sox affiliate team where he would spend the majority of his season without being called up in 1964. In 1965, he found himself in a fourth outfielder role, left-handed hitter role, back in the big leagues, appearing in 81 games while splitting the year between AAA and the majors. He started the year in 1966 with the Red Sox, but in June was traded to the Kansas City A's and finished the 1966 season playing for the A's. In 1967, he would appear in the most games of his career playing for the A's, appearing in 134 games as the everyday left fielder. Jim made the move to Oakland in 1968 with the club and appeared in 88 games playing part-time. After the 1968 season, Gosker was selected by the Seattle Pilots in the expansion draft. He appeared in 39 games for the expansion Seattle club before he was dealt in July to the 1969 New York Mets, also known as the Miracle Mets or the Amazing Mets. He only appeared in 10 games for the Mets that season, where the majority of his time in 1969 was spent with the AAA club after the trade, thus was not on the Mets' playoff and World Series roster. We will touch on that subject just ahead. During the offseason before 1970, Gosker was traded from the Mets to the Giants. He did not make the Major League Club for the Giants, breaking spring training, and they assigned him to AAA, only to be traded a few weeks later to the Montreal Expos. He would then split time between AAA for the Expos and the Majors, appearing in 91 games for the Big League Club. Going into the 1971 season, he returned to the Expos, spending time again in AAA and the Majors. After the 1971 season concluded, ironically, Jim was traded back to the Mets. The next two seasons would have Jim make many trips between New York City and AAA. Gosker would appear in 64 more games in the majors for the Mets from 1972 to 1974. After the 1974 season, Gosker, at the age of 31, was released by the Mets and retired from baseball. After returning home to Michigan, Gosker would get a job working in public service for Port Huron and would become a high school and junior college referee in both football and basketball for over three decades. In total, Gosker played for parts of 10 seasons in the major leagues, being teammates with some of the great Hall of Fame players of all of those teams. 
He has the unique distinction of someone who has played for three teams that no longer technically exist as they have relocated to different cities in the Montreal Expos, the Seattle Pilots, and the Kansas City Athletics. Despite being a part of two very good New York Mets playoff teams in 1969 and 1973, Gosker never did receive a World Series ring for his service on the 1969 team. Ironically, in June of 2019, Gosker was back in the news as the Mets were holding a reunion for the 1969 team and they mistakenly identified Gosker as being deceased in an in-memoriam tribute before a Mets game in June. Gosker took the news lightheartedly as the story gathered national attention and in an interview to a local Michigan television channel stated, well, I don't feel dead. The following day, the Mets did an apology to Gosker and he replied on his social media account, wow, look at me, I made the big board. Thank you, New York Mets, for bringing me back. As of me creating this video, Mr. Gosker is quite live and well living in his childhood home in Port Huron, Michigan. If you wish to view the full television interview, I have attached it in the description below. So, what is the card actually worth in today's market in 2019? An ungraded copy of the rookie card can fetch somewhere between $60 to $125, depending, of course, on condition. However, the graded version of these cards, starting with a PSA 8, can sell for between $600 and $900. With only 34 currently in existence, a PS9 version sold for $6,000 in April of 2017. As of the making of this video, only two PSA 10 mint versions are in existence which have never been sold. But if one were to speculate based on the values of the card from a PSA 9 jump, a PSA 9 to a PSA 10 jump would be valued well over $10,000. So, Gosker, Davis, can say that their rookie card is potentially worth more than $10,000 if it is graded with a PSA 10 designation.